We are back and we are joined now by Remenda Cyrus, the John Lewis Writing Fellow at the American Prospect, uh, whose piece is called Predatory Lendings, Prey of Color. Remenda, thanks so much for coming on today. Hi, Emma. Thank you so much for having me. For sure. So, um, you know, you tell a really important story here, uh, predatory lenders, often payday lenders. You, you, you start your piece and continue through it, like kind of being the emotional heft of it, the story of Miss Lily, uh, a, a woman who was targeted by, by predatory lenders. Let's mm -hmm. start there, if you don't mind, because her story is really a, a typical one when looking at these kinds of issues. Absolutely. And it's funny that you, you call her typical because as we were writing this story, one thing that we kind of came against was her story is atypical in a lot of ways. But the thing about it is that it's so prominent <laughs> that it's an example of how easy it is to get into these type of situations. So Miss Lily is an older 70, uh, 70s woman who she was working, you know, which I think is the most tragic part of it. Like she was working, she had a full time job, she made decent pay at, to her perspective, and she just couldn't afford like her rent one month, you know, and so she had gotten an offer in her directly to her mailbox for like a, you know, like a, it's like a small dollar loan is what it's called. It's not it's like less than like a thousand dollars or so. And it's uh, typically indicative of a predatory lender. Uh, so she got on the bus, she couldn't drive, she got on the bus, got that uh, loan, and it kind of sent, it sent her into a cycle of debt when that's really common here in America. Yeah, I mean, some of these these payday, I mean, they're really the bottom of the barrel in terms of mm -hmm. just like how Absolutely. how they com entirely exploit their consumer base. Um, and mm -hmm. I, 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 I might conflate accidentally payday lenders with predatory lending, but those do payday lending is the primary, I would say, um, one of the primary uh, predatory lenders in this country. Can you explain what the scope of predatory lending is, including the payday lending bulk of it as well? Sure. So a predatory lender is typically something that's called an alternative financial service provider, an AFSP. It's basically a service provider, a money lender, usually, that exists outside of the traditional web of banking that exists here in America. So Chase, Wells Fargo, Citibank, those are all often brick and mortar traditional banking services that have regulations, that have, um, that have a lot of history here in America. So they're very reliable. Um, and not just that, but they are very safe to get loans with. And so pawn shops, credit check cash in places, predatory lenders such as payday lenders, they all exist within this web where they're relying on essentially a vacuum within the financial web of the country where brick and mortar stores are leaving and closing, brick and mortar banks such as Chase are leaving. And now these predatory lenders come in and take that place because people have to get money somewhere a lot of the time. The simple fact is that people working in the, the, the country often don't have enough money to just make their ends meet, make their rent, get food on the table, pay their regular bills. And so they feel forced into this situation where they don't have access to a traditional credit line. Maybe they had bad credit. In Miss Lily's case, she didn't have bad credit, but she had fallen behind on her traditional banking payments and she wasn't able to access that line of credit and she needed money quickly, which is another, you know, people in that situation often just kind of find themselves there, you know? So it's, it's very prominent and very common in the country. And, and what you write about, which I, I was not aware of is how these communities tend to be, as you write bank deserts where mm -hmm. there aren't these kind of more traditional financial service mm -hmm. uh, entities. And so it allows for predatory lenders to be predatory and take up that space. And so just by sheer proximity, they are more likely to be in majority minority communities based on like, I mean, clearly they have some data that they want to ex exploit. <laughs> That's exactly it. Yeah, they know that you know the working class, poor people, and a lot of in a lot of ways, it's simply the way the system has come together. But predatory lenders um, rely on knowing exactly where people are going to need them the most, 
and they know that that's these communities. So it often ends up being poor, working class people of color. And just exacerbating the cycle of debt. I mean, we've talked about this on the show before. It's just the being when you're rich, you get a lot of things for free. You're able mm -hmm. to access uh, lower interest loans. You're able to uh, avoid a lot of the potholes that are set up to trip up poor or middle class people in this country. And it compounds upon itself. And this was clearly a story of that. And, you know, Dodd-Frank was supposed to attack and target predatory lenders, right? Yeah. Um, in the in the wake of the financial collapse. What happened to defang that? Um, and I know a lot of it has to do with Trump and his completely grinding of the CFPB to a halt. But if you don't mind just taking us through that period of time from 2010 when Dodd-Frank passed to, to where we are at now with these predatory lenders. Sure. So Do the Dodd-Frank Act created the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which is a critical bureau that it does exactly what it's called. It protects financial consumers from predatory lenders, from um, bad customer like uh, rendering, things like that. So after Dodd-Frank, Dodd-Frank was really focused on subprime mortgage lending so that was a big part of it. And subprime mortgage lending has, to a certain extent, gone down and it kind of pushed it to the shadows. But even that still existed. So the CFPB was essentially set up to handle everything else in, from there. So when Trump got in office, um, you know, he was in office just six years later. And this was even this was in the making beforehand. It was the the crash was precipitated on the subprime lending that people were content to do, you know? So when he got in office, it was just the culmination of a crusade, if you will, sort of like a lot of things that we've seen, but a culmination in just the effort. So he, and so in 2016, the CFPB issued a payday lending rule and that payday lending rule was essentially just completely taken um, all the meat out of it. It was supposed to provide something called underwriting provisions, sort of like an ability to repay um, rule, which is just they're supposed to make sure that people can pay back the loans. And that was like a critical, critical uh, piece of this. And another portion is that they were supposed to no longer be able to like pull out funds just indiscriminately, you know, if they were getting declines. There were a lot of pieces that went into this payday lending rule that essentially would have just knock the payday lending um, industry, you know, out of, out of uh, filter. So they took to the Supreme Court, or they took to the court in two different cases. One was to essentially take away the power of the CD, CFPB by forcing uh, the, the, the director of the CFPB it was supposed to be like, you could just fire them for something like for cause, you know, but the Supreme Court ruled that that was for some reason unconstitutional. And that put, thankfully that put Ravi Chopper in office, but that was the end of a, one of the parts to take away the power of the CFPB. So in this vacuum that's like been created because the CFPB is fighting for its life right now. It's, it doesn't have any, um, bandwidth, essentially. It, it's now that under Biden with Brookie, it there's more, but it's still, you know, fighting court cases and everything is under extreme skepticism. So the CFPB is essentially unable to do its job. And then there was another court case where they took specifically to target that payday lending rule that I was mentioning earlier. Right. And between those two things, the CFPB just hasn't been able to really make progress. I mean, Dodd-Frank was passed like, you know, 13 years ago now. And that's just not a, like, you know, the CFPB could have done a lot of times, but we were severely stunted, could have done a lot of work, but we were severely stunted in like the first half of the game. And people would not be shocked to know that that court case uh, that you just mentioned was sent to the Fifth Circuit, which is an Ooh. incredibly extremist right wing um, it's circuit court in this country and of course now they've essentially stripped the cfpb of even more of mm -hmm. its power and i guess the supreme court is going to hear 
Mm -hmm. uh, the appeal, when would that be? That case is pending. It's supposed to just be its next session. Uh, so it's just pending right now. Uh, the next session, I'm actually not sure exactly when that is now because I think it's been pushed a little bit, not just, not just the session, but the case itself. But it is pending. So right now, right now there's nothing essentially happening, but the CFPB also kind of has its hands tied because right now there's a, the question on the table is, is this organization itself constitutional? That's like the ultimate question. And the crusade is Of course is, it is, but not, yeah, right. Yeah, it is, <laughs> but that's the crusade, right? Like it's not constitutional. And they're like, it's, it's wild to me that the alternative to something like the CFPB, you know, which you know, isn't perfect, but has been considered like extremely successful in what it has been able to do. It hasn't been able to do everything that it's been like supposed to be able to do, but what it has done, it's been, like I mentioned, subprime mortgage lending has, you know, uh, decreased a little bit. So it has done what it was supposed to do to some extent. And the alternative to not having that agency is just allowing payday lenders, predatory lenders in general, to just have free way, free reign of you know any any market they want to enter, you know it's it would be very deregulated essentially. And already, um, I I saw the st statistic in your piece that mm -hmm. black people in this country are twice as likely to uh, live near um, these small dollar lenders, uh, and that the they're m thus more likely to use them, and mm -hmm. so. The this kind of financial service exploitation is in desperate need of government regulation. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the Biden administration has been way too hands off in its approach to letting the courts kind of delineate how mm -hmm. things are going to go. And so until we hear uh, a ruling from the Supreme Court on this matter, which I don't have optimism about, this kind of stuff mm -hmm. is going to keep going on. Yeah, and it as you said, the 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 driving force of the piece is really the emotional heft of it. It's just so important to emphasize the like the desperation people feel, and then the stress that it puts them under when it's something as simple as you know trying to pay your rent or trying to put food on the table, and it's entirely like a system of our creating, you know, like these systems that we put in place have led to here and the people that are you know suffering are the people that often always suffer you know so i just i can't see a solution where the cfpb is unconstitutional and we don't have anything in place because that would really just make the situation a lot worse absolutely well uh we'll put a link to your piece in the description wherever you're listening to this and uh at majority.fm Remenda Cyrus uh, of the American Prospect. The piece is called Predatory Lending's Prey of Color. I'd encourage everybody to check it out. Thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me, Emma. For sure.